The names of those lost in this video were all shared publicly by the victims' families. This video is intended to be a small and impersonal tribute and celebration of the work of those who perished unduly in the 2019 Kyoto Animation arson attack. It is made out of respect and love. In 2016, I spent three months walking through my favorite anime film, The Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. I took shots, symbols, and phrases one at a time to disseminate and interpret the multitude of parts that contribute to making it a legendary film. The experience left me with an even greater respect for the craftsmanship and awareness of the people who manifested the film and all its ideas into reality. And while I have no shortage of superlatives to lay at the feet of the original author Tanagawa, or at the feet of the performances of the English and Japanese voice actors. The truth of the matter is that the almost inconceivably perfect execution on behalf of the staff at Kyoto Animation is what allowed the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya to extend beyond a seasonal anime and become a worldwide craze. One where inmates would dance the Hari Hari Yukai, um, endless fans online would rage at Endless 8, and the landscape of the modern anime fandom would be forever affected by its wake. Because of my personal relation to the film, and, and the relation I may have had to others' enjoyment with the consumption of the film, I feel obligated to offer up some form of tribute. And I can't draw fan art. I sure can't dance the Hari Hari Yukai. Uh, I can only barely play God Knows on my guitar. So because I do owe something to the memory and legacy of those who made my favorite film, and as way of eulogy, I'll do what I can do and talk. Before we get to the names in the film, I kind of want to speak a little bit first. I think the ethereal relation between a media producer and the consumer is one that I've always been interested in and one that I've talked about when discussing media criticism and narrative engagement as a whole. I've always subscribed to the idea of a communal engagement, a duality between the audience and the artist, between the creation and the consumption, and between the offer and the reception. That is, by watching a film, you hope to find something intrinsic and true about the nature of the world and our experiences and lives in it. And by making a film, you would hope to convey just that. So I find it not really surprising at all that a skilled storyteller and a talented artist or a team of such with a single-minded purpose would be able to touch or maybe affect or convey, is a better word, their willing audience. And it's that wispy influence a two and a half hours of shared passion and understanding about human existence, which left an influence on me. That that connection could be so poignant and vibrant every time I think on it or rewatch the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. I think that's the reason I was so crushed at the news of their murder. Perhaps, though, that's just the magic of fiction. Maybe some of their self-story, their truths, their passions and thoughts and desires, the multitude of choices that made them the people they were, made it through in their work. And perhaps across all obstacles of distance and language and medium, you who watch their work receive the smallest part of their own self-story, as reflected in Kyon and Yuki and Haruhi. And I like that, because then their values can live on for as long as their art remains. So perhaps this research and these quotes that I've found will help you better appreciate the show and the film. Perhaps I can further convince you of the technical mastery of Disappearance, if the extant six hours that I've made hadn't already. Perhaps there's just something poetic and justifiable in nature about lauding the efforts of the fallen dead. Perhaps I'll be able to finish this and stop crying if I get this out and on YouTube. Of the 35 people who passed away on the fire of July 18th, 16 names were released publicly by their surviving families. Of those 16 names willingly shared, 7 worked on the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. To quote one of my favorite books, a book that Yuki Nagato sure has read, but likely Kyon hasn't, quote, to understand who a person really was, what his or her life really meant, 
A speaker for the dead would have to explain their self-story, what they meant to do, what they actually did, what they regretted, and what they rejoiced in. That's the story that we never know. The story we can never know. And yet, at the time of death, that's the only story truly worth telling. Orson Scott Card, the speaker for the dead. I wish so much that I could tell you all about their lives and loves and thoughts. I wish I could even go into their entire careers and do a proper eulogy for each of them. But that's outside the scope of my ability. Hell, I wish I could conclusively attribute their works in, even in just this film. But any specific attribution is muddied behind the collaborative creation of film and the fog of translation and distance and time. I'll do my best then to point out the efficacy of the elements that their position contributed to the film. And may the dead forgive my errors and my ignorance. Let's start somewhere pretty easy and pretty obvious. Mikiko Watanabe was one of the background artists for Disappearance. Background art in particular is one of the strengths that Kyoto Animation hangs its hat on, and it should come as no surprise that in their first feature-length film, the quality of that art is astonishing. Whether it's the austere sterility of Yuki's apartment, or how that apartment ever so slightly changes to be a little bit more brighter and welcoming, or how drab the school grounds look in a world without Haruhi. All of the background art is in line with the director's intentions and with the purpose of the film. I do want to just point out a couple aspects that elevate this background art to the level of exceptional. First is a commitment to realism. We'll talk specifically later about how the character art might deviate from this, but the background art specifically has an almost unnecessary level of detail to it. Take, for example, the mesh on the chain link fence in this shot, or the discoloration on the walls and the floor of Kyon's hospital room. This detail gives the impression to the viewer that nothing extraordinary is happening with the world itself, or by the world itself. It's because of the detail selling this grounding that we're able to manage the expectations of fantasy. And it's because of the lack of fantasy in the environment that the show is able to move forward with the points of Yuki's normalcy. Of Kyon's earnest realization that he values the fantasy of Haruhi. And the movie is able to point out the absurdity of how little the world actually did change. And then contrast that with Kyon's reactions. The second point I love about the background art is the simple way that darkness is used. Sure, we have astonishing shots with overwhelming darkness, and just a level of detail in the backgrounds that truly makes the mouth gape. For instance, this shot with Kyon under the light is probably one of my favorite in all of anime. But even with a more subdued composition, you see the extreme skill of the background artist in portraying the lack of light. For example, this shot of Kyon in the hallway wouldn't have nearly the impact if the contrast was different on this background. Say if the wood wasn't as glossy, or the shadows as ominous and diffused. Every time I rewatch this film, I'm struck every single time by how dark they allow this to be. On many of these shots, you can barely even see what's going on on screen. But I'll be damned if it isn't the most effective thing possible for the mood. It feels like you could almost tell the entire story of Disappearance without any of the cell animation or audio if you were just looking at the backgrounds of the scenes, the prevailing colors, the kind of emotional state that they put you in. Showing you even those, it would be very clear to see that this is a story about an escape from darkness, a return to the color, and as we talked about previously, the other light sources that are offered to Kyon in his attempt to return. Honestly, you could just boot up a random place in the film and then hit pause and check out the background art and consider the lighting and the composition, the colors, what it means for that point in the story and the line that's being set over it. Every single time you're going to find something special. So well done, Mikiko, for giving us beautiful shots like the school here and for infusing every little bit with poignant meaning. That makes it pretty easy to transition into another area that suffered a huge loss. That would be the color design and keying of the film, done almost entirely by Naomi Ishida. 
their responsibility would have been to take the animation stills, every frame of animation throughout the entire movie, and assign a color to everything that's not a part of the background. For example, the fact that Kyon's skin is noticeably darker than Mikuru's, or that the shadows on Kyon's shirt should be right about here and have a different level of lighter black ray than the windows behind him or the darkness of his hair. And just like the background artist too, the job of color design would have to be so much aware of the mood of each scene, what's trying to be conveyed, what the lighting is like, and what emotion the audience is supposed to be receiving at this moment. I hope you believe me when I say I would not necessarily talk in superlatives if they didn't deserve it, but here I love every single choice Ishida makes over the course of this film. Let's take out a few examples and I'll show you how concise and effective it is. Take the earthy greens on Kion's coat fading him into the background here, but then that same coat being a soft enveloping deep blue-gray in the moonlight with Yuki here, as if it's splitting the distance between Kion's deep green and Yuki's pale blue. Then, of course, using a palette of bright, crisp browns in order to highlight moe art choice and form this endearing, nostalgic moment. And of the same accord, the soft, beautiful moments when Nagato offers some light to Gion. In these moments, though, the contrast is higher, uh, the world is not universally illuminated, the shadows are more pronounced, and the entire place is less saturated. But using the exceptions is easy. I think what makes the color design of this film so great is that for the majority of the film, as Kion is in a world speckled by gray, it seems most of the colors of the characters we already know from Haruhi are speckled by gray too. Again, how perfect and how unified all of these decisions from these separate artists are towards one singular purpose. Thank you, Naomi Ishida. There's an interesting credit listed for Sachi Suda. It would appear that they did the paint and special effects for the film. Now, painting itself is simple enough. They would take the information and color design laid out by Naomi Ishida and fill it in using the paint bucket tool or whatever tools are necessary. It's not inherently too creative of a role. But they're also credited with the special effects on the film. Now, that could be any number of things, really, um, from Kion opening his eyes to uh, some of the elements of the CGI. But I think what's most probable is it's the uh, stuff you would do in After Effects, such as when he meets Ryoko Asakura again for the first time and then rushes out into the hallway and there's that Dutch angle and it's all blurry. The blurriness, of course, would be added in post-processing in After Effects to create that kind of Gaussian blur. Also, of course, you probably wouldn't animate text, especially when you're trying to do a computer screen or the words that come up when Kion talks to himself. I think it's very likely that Sachi Suda had something to do with these. How much of that is their own creativity coming through? Again, too fine a detail and not enough information. But I think much like the old acting verbiage, there are no small roles. So too do I think there are no small influences on a creative work. And every single thing, every time you have the opportunity to do something or influence something as large as a movie, I think you can't help but put some of yourself into it. So in those small instances, Sachi Suda, thank you for your contribution. So now we've reached the point where we're going to be talking about the people who actually animated everything. And I'll not beat around the bush, these losses are incredibly heavy. First you have Yoshiji Kigami. Kigami was 61 at the time of his passing, and I mention that only because the laundry list of the things that he had influence on and worked on during his career is astounding. Even outside of the scope of Kyoto Animation, the man had done key art for Akira, Doraemon, or Shin-chan. For Kyoto Animation, he not only directed all of Munto, but also the list of scenes that he animated or storyboarded. It's just astonishing. They almost all have a ton of motion and emotion to them, and fluidity. And it's not surprising to me at all, seeing these scenes, that he was somewhat of a mentor to everybody else on the staff. On your first day as a director, you could tell that he's your ace in the hole for any type of difficult or complicated or impactful emotional scene. It's unfortunate then that we don't have the exact cuts that he animated on Disappearance, and he's only listed for one such cut in the entire Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, this one right here. 
So we'll just have to assume, um, using the information that we have of Yui seeming or Kumiko running through the bridge, or Violet going on a wartime rampage, that the directors and animation directors would have likely used him in scenes where they needed a lot of fluidity and motion conveyed, and that were very important to the film. I would probably put that on Kyon running with the train in the background, or maybe the scene just before when he grabs Taniguchi and shakes him violently. As it's uncredited, he's probably a better bet than most to be the person responsible for drawing the slow motion stabbing of Kyon. His passing is truly a terrible loss for any fans of Sakuga and the type of people who will find out who animated each cut, and considering his role as a mentor and an ace in the hole for Kyoto Animation for years and years, I... Thank you, Yoshiji Kigami, for the work you did on this film, for even getting Kyoto Animation to this point in the first place to be able to make this film, and most of all, that one part in the Lucky Star opening where each of the girls dance individually. That loss in and of itself would be a pretty hard one to take and a savage blow to both the animation studio and the industry at large. But I'm afraid that's not even the worst news for the animators of the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. The animation production was split up into six parts, each part having a different animation director. Over top of these six animation directors, this film had two chief animation directors. Both of them were killed in the arson attack. Just purely as a list of accomplishments, Shoko Ikeda, she was the character designer of the All of Haruhi franchise. She also happens to be credited as Ultra Chief Animation Director on the film, which in and of itself says a good deal about how well she understood and related to the work she was working on. Futoshi Nishia did the character designs for the spin-offs like Haruhi-chan, uh, but also was the chief animation director for the second season of the Haruhi episodes that aired in 2009, meaning he's to thank for how gorgeous that animation is during Endless 8, and a large part of why everyone was upset that they had wasted all those resources. Thankfully, for these two at least, there is a translated interview between them talking about what they did on the film. So we have some sort of lens into their minds and can talk a bit more concretely about how they viewed the movie and what they were trying to convey. Something I found particularly enlightening was um, these quotes from Ikeda, where she says, quote, In order to not make the characters too realistic, we would do things like not attach shadows or make their face muscles limper. I advised everyone to insert a bit of flexibility in expressions or body postures in order to show focus on the emotional drama foremost. I also find it quite interesting that she says she wanted to bring out the gallant atmosphere of Haruhi, but she advised them not to overdo it on the cuteness overall. I find this particularly interesting because this is the character designer of the original Haruhi. These are character designs that would go on to influence Kaon and would be the face of anime fandom at large for years, herald in a new era of moe appreciation and cute girls doing cute things as a viable genre, taking light novel descriptions and illustrations and turning them into a phenomenon and an artistic movement and financial marketing success. And here she says that they didn't want to make the characters too cute or too realistic because it wouldn't help the emotional drama of the film, the level of awareness and craftsmanship to be able to put behind your own previously successful works and innovate even using the same characters, to willingly hold yourself back creatively and not indulge in the single thing that made Kyoto Animation the most successful. Check the Blu-ray sales and the merchandising if you don't believe me. And to do this for the purpose of serving the message of the movie itself. That's astonishing. Ikida mentions that they instead focused heavily on the character's expressions and gestures, specifically facial expressions. For this, Ikida mentions post-transformation Nagito as being a big one. Nishia considers Kyon on the same level. They go on to mention a few scenes specifically, and I'm sure if you've seen Disappearance, you'll know exactly what those are. When Nagato in the post-disappearance world is shown on screen, there is a, um reserved subtlety to her actions, but certainly not a stoicism. They mention specifically the scene in which Kyon and Nagato meet in the post-disappearance world and Kyon restrains Nagato. 
I think you can really understand why they were so concerned about this scene and conveying the emotions that Nagato is feeling. There's these very discreet flinches, the need to combine the animation with the voice actors panning and the pacing of the book falling. They bring up her posing, that they need to have body language that Nagato hasn't had before, and they need to convey a sense of having no self-confidence in her. Adjusting her glasses and tilting her head and things like that. What I appreciate is that they realize that this is the core of the film. It's the most important thing. Years ago, when I went through this movie scene by scene, we talked about the different objectives Kyoen has and how he doesn't realize what's really going on until it's too late. Without this level of subtlety in Nagato's performance, without it being front and center on a big screen, being shown to the viewer and conveyed to the viewer so that they may figure out the riddle before Kyon or alongside of Kyon, then the movie would cease to operate with that layer of depth to it. They also note that Kyon finding the bookmark was a large scene that they wanted to get right. And boy did they. Look at Kion's face afterwards, the slight blush, his small grin, his almost maniacal thousand-yard stare, his head bouncing up with hope, but his hand still shaking. I truly do think that even without the context, even without knowing what the bookmark says or what it means, a viewer would still be able to see this and understand all of the emotions that Kion is going through. And all of this, too, from... The animator who true horror he is, she sings God Knows. So again, thank you so much, Shoko Ikida. And thank you so much, Fatoshi Nishia, for truly understanding the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya and then having the skill and the awareness and the leadership to focus the animation onto a single defined purpose so as to effectively manipulate the viewer into feeling the same emotions as the characters and telling a story without words. Finally, I'd like to pay our respects to Yasuhiro Takemoto. In doing this research, part of the unusual and exemplary nature of Kyoto Animation that came out was the aspect of collaboration. It seemed like everywhere I turned, every interview I read, even in the special features DVDs, the entire staff were very much on the same page. Not only, you know, production-wise, but also in understanding the material. I think it's rare in anything, not just animation, to see a group of people come together and have a single-minded vision that they all share. And in no place did I get this more than from Takemoto and his influences on the film. At the head of the creative end of the process, there were three main influences to making the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya, and these are the people that made the storyboards for the film. The first was Noriko Takao. I think it's very clear that she, more than anybody else, understood really the themes in the original novel and what the movie was going to try to say, how each character was a piece of this story and in, in their own separate way. Whenever she talks about things, she does so very intradiegetically. I think a lot of the innate greatness of the film comes from Takao's interpretation and vision. The other directors even mentioned things like how she saw Yuki as a woman or how she interpreted and used Koizumi in the film, all in ways that they never would have come up with themselves. She would go on to leave Kyoto Animation years later and, of course, wouldn't be at risk in the fire. The second was Tatsuya Ishihara. In both the series and the movie, he was the elder and uh, more responsible of the creatives. He was a steady hand and a reference for everyone to go off of, um, having directed previous works for Kyoto Animation. He definitely understood the emotional core of the film, but he also considers more practical concerns, such as pacing or adapting certain scenes in certain ways. He definitely had a keen eye for the viewer's experience. He often refers to the movie in extra diegetic terms, and it would be pretty hard to overstate the value of stability and reliability in a production as big as this movie. But thankfully, Ishihara was not in the Kyoto Animation offices on the day of the arson attack. Takamoto, of course, was. It's clear reading everything that Takamoto was a people person, one of those naturally empathic people, and it's very clear that he could listen. I credit him with how well the communication on the film went, from collaborating with the other two, to conveying the message to the animation directors and background artists, even down to directing the voice actors, which Takamoto was entirely responsible for, and has a number of great quotes about. 
if it was Takao who had the brilliant interpretation of Koizumi in this movie as a person not chosen, then it was Takamoto who told the legendary voice actor Daisuke Ono to deliver the lines Koizumi has as a sad clown. The movie's producer shared a great story about Takamoto. He said that multiple times throughout production, uh, Takamoto would question why Taniguchi has a role in this film or why he was given the role of the person that knows Haruhi. The producer then says that when the original creator of Haruhi, the author, Tanagawa, saw the film, the first thing that he said to the producer after watching it was why Taniguchi was given the role he was in the film. Completely independently, with no prompting whatsoever, both the original creator and the director Takamoto had the same idea about the film. They rarely speak about Takamoto as giving an individual contribution to this film, saying things like, we decided that we weren't going to move the camera very much. And it's very clear in the behind-the-scenes footage that he's not somebody who is taking a lot of credit for himself, nor is he ever forceful. He's mostly in the background, listening first, and then making very simple and poignant suggestions after other people have shared their ideas. But there are a number of things that are directly credited to him. As director, he's responsible for everything that goes into the film. And in behind-the-scenes footage, you can see Ishihara and Takamoto sitting there and analyzing every single little detail. From the opening credit scene text placement to creating a mask on the final scene when Yuki brings the book up to her face because they believe the shade of blue was off. To adjusting the key animation in one of Kyon's frames because his scarf jumps around a bit too much. There's such an attention to detail and a love for the material and a passion behind it and a sense of pride and care in what they're doing. But of course that's not everything. As far as storyboards go, he and Ishihara split the beginning and the end of the movie. And we know he was responsible for Kyon waking up. He talks specifically about the semiotics and infusing it with as much meaning as possible. These symbols that I took hours explaining years ago, of the light shining through, of the clock being upside down, the focalization inside of his head, all of that comes from Takamoto. And you have him to thank as well for the entire segment where Kyon is talking and arguing with himself. There's just an unbridled creativity to that scene. With the camera flying in, with the Christmas trinkets, with the white snowflakes and the cutouts of the other characters. I said it years and years ago, but I'll say it again, it's unparalleled. I think that if there was nothing else that Takemoto had done, if... He had nothing else to his name, if he never saved Lucky Star, if he never went on to direct Hyoka and many other highly regarded shows, if he didn't help KyoAni function as a coherent unit, and if you took away even all that communication and leadership that we talked about before, then this one segment of this film, it would still stand as a shining beacon of creativity. It would still rank among the best animated scenes ever storyboarded, and his legacy would be secure for that alone. To quote Takamoto, I feel like I'm not a director who doesn't think about his work, but I've become a director who gives it his all when I receive a work that I'm affected by. If I don't encounter something that I don't want to depict, then I don't depict it. He goes on to say in a later interview, Turn your focus to yourself and dig inside. When you make something, you show the audience part of yourself, so you have to sharpen who you are as well. Once you understand who you are, then you may understand how to make something. Takamoto was the consummate director and the best you could ever ask for. As a boss, as an artist, as a fan, and I'd sincerely and honestly like to thank everyone who was responsible for contributing to the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya for being skilled and brave enough to show their audience part of themselves. Because as cheesy as it sounds, even after they're gone, that part of themselves that they poured into this film still remains. At the premiere, Koizumi's voice actor, Daisuke Ona, comments that the line in the film that made him cry was 
after Kion says, remember John Smith, remember that I was here. I don't think there's any better eulogy for the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya than that. To everyone in Kyoto Animation who now only lives on in their artwork, thank you, and we will always remember that you were here. <laughs>